Hello, everybody. I hope you are doing well. I'm excited for this evening. My name is Rian Griff. I will be your host for the evening. Um, and welcome to this special event. This is our first episode <laughs> of this year's um, inspiring discussions. And what we're doing today and over the next coming few weeks is having just open discussions with some very inspirational people in the lead up to our Run Forest Run team event that is happening um, at the beginning of July this year. So during this build up, um, what, what can you expect? Um, so we are like Run Forest Run. Run Forest Run is a running community that loves the outdoors and being active as well as using our skills and talents for good. So we're running for good. And the charity that we're raising funds for, for the past, over the past seven years is run, um, is for Africa. And for Africa is the biggest non-governmental organization in Africa. And they've got like a 39 year rec um, track record of how they um, come alongside the local communities and through education, through feeding schemes, come and make a sustainable change in, in the local communities. And we are so grateful to come alongside them and partner with them. And this year is no different. This year, we are taking on the further challenge. And what does the further challenge mean? Well, we're each one going further than we've ever gone before in our lives. So for myself, I will be taking on a 700 kilometer run between the 23rd and the 30th of June, where I'm going to try and beat the existing record between the national three peaks. Currently, that um, record is eight and a half days. And um, for the rest of the people that's um, part of this Run Forest Run team, they're all going to run further than they've ever gone before in their lives. So whether that is their first 5K in their life, first 10K, first half marathon, first marathon, first ultra marathon, it doesn't matter. Um, but for each one of them, they're expanding their horizons and they are running for good. And that is what um, we are here for. And we are so privileged to have with us tonight, Luzon Kutsia, who's no... Um, stranger to what it means to expand horizons and run for good and break records and all of that. So we're hoping to, during this session, as well as the, the sessions to come, just tap into her expertise, her experience, and learn from, from her and her love that she has um, for running and making a difference in people's lives. So we're, before introducing Luzon, I I um, just wanted to let you know how this session is going to run. So we're going to give Luzon a few minutes um, to, to chat to us about like what's on her heart. And then after that, we're going to have questions and answers. So please feel free to use the, the Q&A section on Zoom to write up your, your um, messages of encouragement <laughs> or uh, questions and then we'll take it from there. So without further ado, um, Luzon, welcome. It is incredible to have you here and it, we're know, know. really looking forward to, to chat to you tonight. Hi, Rian. It is really awesome to be here and what a privilege to be involved in um, such an amazing community who does such amazing work and I think doing that challenge that you are going to do is very inspirational. So well done on that. I would be very nervous. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for having me. Do you want me to just get started? Okay. Okay, cool. Well, in the briefing, Rian said I had 20 minutes. So 20 minutes is quite long for me. Um, but what I would love to do is just to share with you guys a bit of my story in terms of where I came from and where I am today with running. I think my relationship with running has changed a lot over the last four years. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of things that have contributed to that. But I initially, I never used to run at school. So I was never a very sporty person. I used to compete, but I was that person that competed in athletics in school in every event just to get points for the team. So I was never really a strong runner. And I remember in my matric year, all of us decided to do the 800 meters. And it seemed so far at that time when I was running it in my matric year. And I can't believe now, like it's it's actually so close for me. Um, so my running career started, um, I always say it started by accident, but what happened was I had just come to university. I studied at a university in South Africa in Bloemfontein, which is in the center of South Africa. And I was a freshman, like a freshman, like they would say in America, in South Africa, you call it a first year student. So I was here for my first time. And at in our first year, we have an athletics event, which is called the first year's athletics event. And then that's basically where all the first years compete. And yeah, you know, the residences compete against each other for points. And I was in a meeting in my res one night and it was the meeting was dragging on. It was taking very long and it was close to 12 o'clock at night. And I literally wanted to get the meeting over and done with. And I, the, the lady looking for volunteers for the first year's athletics was struggling. And I literally volunteered and I said, okay, I will do it. And that completely backfired because then she said to me, okay, I'll put your name down, but you have to stay after the meeting. So <laughs> then I couldn't even go to bed after the meeting. I had to stay behind to explain to her because I am a totally blind athlete. So for me, that in essence means that every step I take, I have to have a guide runner with me, which means that I'm tethered to somebody else who then explains to me what is happening on the road or the track whilst I run. Um, so I had to explain to her how guiding worked and what it entailed. And one of the girls in the residence went with me and I competed at the first year's athletics. And then my the, the student in charge of sport at my res, um, she really wanted me to get coaching. And like it is with, you know, with your elders, you don't want to disappoint somebody. So then I started with coaching. And that is actually how my athletics career started. But there's obviously been a few um, challenges. So the first coach I was with was a sprinting coach. And I very quickly realized that that was really not for me. I don't like 100 meters and 200 meters and stuff at all. I hate it. Um, and so I was with that coach for about three weeks and then I just started jogging and, you know, just to stay fit and healthy and like it was sort of a very good coping mechanism for me on campus. And um, then my mom is a teacher at a school here in Bloemfontein and then one of her colleagues actually introduced me to road running. So five months after I started with my first year at university, I ran my first 10K on the road, which is very exciting. It was in the winter here in Bloom. It was cold. Um, I still remember it was very scary for my mom because we were on a sporty family. So my, my parents didn't really run. Nobody in my family does a lot of sport. So doing a 10K was like hectic for them. They were like, what? Um, <laughs> So for them, it was quite interesting that I was I was running. Um, yeah, and then at the end of my first year, I joined a long distance coach for the first time who approached me after seeing me at a road race and asked me if I've ever considered doing like longer track. Um, so middle distance and long distance track running. And obviously I said no, because I, I never had. And it really seemed like something that was out of my league. Um, I mean, he was talking like between 800 meters and a 5,000 meters on the track. And I just felt like that is very intense. I'm not ready to do that. Um, but yeah, then I started with him in December of 2012. And the next year at national championships, I actually qualified for my first world champs in in July of, of 2013 and it was really so it was something that I never focused on so I didn't go to nationals thinking okay I'm going to qualify I literally after nationals about three months after nationals I got an email from SASCOC which is the Olympic body um, 
in South Africa and they literally said to me, you've qualified for world championships. Um, are you interested in going? And I went because obviously it was a chance to go to France and it was um, my, I think it was my first time um, going international. So it was my first time going overseas. So I was very excited. I went and I ran, I came second last, but that was okay for me. It was more about the experience. Um, and then my long journey of competing started, which I never actually looked for at all. Um, I then went to world championships again in 2015. And I think the turning point was for me at that world champs, because I realized I, I don't want to do athletics halfway. And I then decided that I was going to give it four years for the next cycle for the 2020 Paralympics. And I was just going to give it my all until 2020 and see where it would lead me. Um, because obviously, you know, having started in 2012, going to the 2016 games would have been, I think it would have been a big ask for me to, to do anything competitive wise. But nonetheless, I was lucky enough to go to the to the Rio Games. And um, at the Rio Games, I had one of my biggest disappointments of my career because um, at the Rio Games, I got disqualified um, for a guide error in my race. And that was very difficult for me because there was obviously a big hype before the Games and everybody was very excited. And yeah, I felt... I felt like I disappointed everybody and my parents came to watch um, and I just felt that I disappointed people and I disappointed myself and my guide felt disappointed and I think it was just it was really I had to go through a grieving process and um, I think it was about two days afterwards I had I got up and my guide and I actually decided to go and run far that morning um, like like quite far um, because we weren't in the final and and that Saturday before we went, came home was the day of the final and when I woke up I kind of realized that I had I had a choice with regards to this disappointment I could either choose to be disappointed and have it determine the rest of my career or I could just use it as an opportunity to educate um, different pockets of people or different communities of people about disabled sport um, and how disabled sport works because I think there's quite a big um, I don't think a lot of people know exactly how it works and I think a lot of people think it's just a rule like there's no rules of competing or anything and there actually is quite a lot of rules and the athletes have to go through quite a lot in order to compete at a Paralympics so yeah, when I then obviously came back, people asked me many questions and I just, I tried to educate people as far as I could in terms of disabled sport. Um, and then in a nutshell, I went, I went to London, yay, in 2017. London is one of my favorite cities. Um, I've done the London Marathon twice there. Um, I went to London in um, 2017 and I competed in the 1,500 meters again, which was the same event I competed at in Rio and I came fourth, which was obviously for me, it was really an awesome improvement on the previous year. So I came fourth and I was very happy with that result. And then um, my coach and I seriously started talking about, you know, I'm doing this track, but he's always had in mind that I, I, he wants me to do a marathon um, and it's quite a big jump from track 1,500 meters up to a marathon. Um, yeah, and then I actually did my first marathon in Johannesburg in South Africa in 2017. It was horrendous. Um, I did the Soweto Marathon. So if there is anybody from South Africa, you would know Johannesburg is really not flat. People tell you it's flat. It's not flat. Um, so my first marathon race was, was quite challenging. I hit a wall at 18 kilometers and I never recovered. I literally was walking a lamppost and running a lamppost. Um, yeah, so that was a hectic experience for me. Um, and it was at altitude. So it was very, it was very hard. Um, I, after that, I, I swore I would never run a marathon again, but yeah, I didn't really didn't pan out that way. 
Um, <laughs> so in 2018, I came back and I did uh, the Berlin and that went great. So that was a good race. Um, and then we started seriously talking about qualifying in the marathon for Tokyo 2020 Paralympics. So um, we, the para athletics usually use the London marathon for world championships. So we actually just use the same event and we run our world champs. So in 2019, I went and I lined up in London and it, yeah, it was really an amazing experience. Um, but once again, tough and challenging race for me. So about three weeks before we went, I, I, I had an ITB injury. Oh, I, I, I sort of started getting an ITB injury and um, the week before we left, I got a shot of cortisone and, you know, things, things went better from there. But um, I, I, when I, um, when I started, when I went to London, um, the shot of cortisone kind of started wearing out and the ITB injury was flaring up again. Um, so I think that was one of the races where I was most nervous in, in my life because I knew at the start line I was going to run with, with pain and with an injury. And I said to my guide that day that um, I was literally, we would do, like I was doing math in terms of how much could I walk, how much could I not walk in order to make the qualifying time. And when we hit the eight, I, I cannot remember when I said to him that I'm in pain, but I, he said, like, when I hit the 8K mark, I said to him, okay, the injury is, like, I'm in pain now. Um, and, yeah, we decided to, to continue up to the 21K mark, which there was a physio um, working at the 21K mark. Because, um, so this guy, Michael Collins, he is a physio from, I think it's, uh, he, like he's, he lives in England now, but he's from Scotland, I think. And he, um, he actually physioed me um, the, the days leading up to the London. Um, and he was working for World Parathletics at the halfway mark as a referee. And I remember we, we came by him and we asked him like, what is gonna happen if we, if we continue? Like, are we gonna do some damage? And he said, no, if you, if you continue, you're, you're going to be okay. You're not going to do any damage. So yeah, we decided we like, we want to finish the marathon. It's not about times anymore. We don't even really care about, like we took this decision, me and my guide together. We just want to finish. Fortunately for me, um, I cannot remember much. Like I can remember the crowds and I can remember like just the amazing experience um in the in the like in the final few kilometers but fortunately for me we made the the qualification cut off by like two minutes which was intense <laughs> um so so yeah fortunately like we did qualify um and i'm very fortunate like looking back like that was an amazing like grace um yeah so we qualified and then I qualified for track and COVID hit and the Paralympics was postponed by a year, um, which I know a lot of people were very like stressed about and panicked about, but I sort of, I was very happy. I thought it, was, it gave me some more time to, you know, work on things that I still wanted to work on before the game started. So I, um, 2021 came and, um, yeah, I actually didn't have a good first half of the year. I had a difficult first part of the season. And um, we started prepping for world championships uh, for um, for Tokyo in May of 2021. And uh, yeah, we went. We went to Tokyo. It was really amazing. Like the experience in total was amazing. So I did compete in Tokyo in both events. So I competed in the 1,500 meters as well as the marathon. Um, which I did get a bit of like questions from the selection committee. Like we all had like the, the whole team, the people who were selected had interviews. And I remember some of the selection committee members frowned a bit upon doing, you know, doing the two distances, but I kind of promised them that I would focus on the 1,500 meters because that was my biggest medal prospect. So in the four months leading up to the Tokyo 2021 or 2020 Tokyo Paralympics, 
I never did a long run past the 12 kilometers. Um, so yeah, getting to Tokyo, having run 15 Ks four months ago, and now having to compete in a marathon was quite scary, but I decided to not focus on that. Um, our track race was first, so we focused on our track race first. Um, and yeah, there's so many experiences that I could share with you um, in the Q&A, but we, we fortunately managed to run a PB for me and we managed to win a silver medal, um, which was really a very cool experience for me. It was, I've, I competed nine years before that internationally and that was my first medal. Uh, and I really honestly don't know how to describe the feeling for you. It just, it really was amazing. And it was, it was so cool to stand there in your country's colors and, you know, just represent your country. So yeah, having won my first medal, I had to then shift my focus over to the marathon race, um, which was difficult for me because you kind of on a high, but we decided to approach the marathon in Tokyo um, like a park run. That sounds, I know that sounds strange, but we really didn't expect anything great from the marathon because I didn't do a lot of mileage in the buildup to the Paralympics. And it just, it just wasn't the focus of the games for us. It was literally my guide and I, um, we just wanted to to have fun and we wanted to run the marathon for the enjoyment of running um and yeah we lined up that morning never knowing what would happen and we had a we had an hydration strategy and it was one of the few races where i managed to stick completely to my hydration strategy which i hadn't trained for at all so <laughs> Please don't follow my advice. I think I can write a book on how not to train for a marathon. Um, but yeah, we kind of discussed and planned a strategy, but we we didn't practice for it at all. Um, and we managed to run a bronze medal, which really was amazing for us. Um, it was something that we didn't expect. It was it was really just such a such sort of such grace that we managed to do that um having done such a little mileage before then and you know having never practiced any hydration having didn't we didn't really know what to expect with the athletes going into the marathon um it it really was just an amazing amazing race and i think it was one of those races where everything falls into place you know you get some of those and then you get marathons where everything falls apart I've, I've had a few of those as well. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was my second international medal after having run internationally for nine years. And it really, ugh, I'm so thankful for both of the medals. And I, I thought I would retire after Tokyo, but I didn't. Um, so at the moment, yeah, we are training for, um, for the Paris 2024 Paralympics. We have world champs later this year in July um, in Paris. I'm at the moment, I'm a little bit nervous because we are all sick. So I train with two guides, one guide for road and one guide with for track. Um, so my road guide Klaus was sick last week and my track guide and I are a bit sick at the moment. So yeah, we just hope that prep from next week will be okay. Yeah, I'm, I am a little bit nervous at the moment, but I think it's just a wobble for me. I think we all get bubbles sometimes um but yeah i'm very excited to go to worlds and i'm very i'm very hopeful and i'm excited that we would possibly qualify and be able to go to tokyo uh, to paris next year i keep on talking about tokyo sorry um so so we we hope to qualify and go and compete there in in paris next year it would really be amazing and i i want to do the same i want to do the double again um yeah, and, and the reason I say that my perspective towards running has changed quite a bit is that after Tokyo, I really felt the need to, um, to start giving back to the community. And that's why um, we did an outreach program last year in, in a rural town called Louis Trichard in South Africa, which is 
it's very far from Bloom. I think it's about 900 kilometers from Bloemfontein. So we drove up and um, we, there's a few, one of my friends who also competed at the games, she, she kind of like, she let me know that they would like us to get involved because there's a few schools for the blind in that area. So we um, gave a running clinic and we gave some orientation in terms of how to run with a guide. It was really lots of fun. We spent about four days there and we decided to then launch a foundation as well to, to aim to support communities and to be able to like to aim to educate communities with regards to how to run with guides and for blind runners to get education and create awareness and possibly provide funding for people for opportunities um, who do who are blind and who want to run um, and who want to compete. So so yeah, we we're busy with quite a few things. Um, and that's basically my story. I I don't know if if Rian wants me to expand on anything else. I think I actually did speak quite long now. Apologies. Um, but yeah, that's basically that's who I am. And um, yeah, just maybe a little bit of background on my family. I was born blind. I'm the eldest of two daughters. My dad is a dairy farmer outside the city of Bloemfontein, so I'm actually quite close to my parents. And then my sister is a veterinary nurse in a town not very far from where we live, so about 160 kilometers. So we also see her quite a lot. We're a close family. And I also have a guide dog. She's a white Labrador, and her name is Isabel. And then I also have um, my retired guide dog still lives with me. Her name is Oakley, and she's a black lab. And then I also have two cats who also live with me. So yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> that's a big family. It is awesome. quite a big family and we're all <laughs> girls. I feel very sorry for my fiance. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> thank you so, so much, Luzon. Um, and everyone that's um, joining in and have listened, please feel free to um, pop your question in the Q&A um, section or raise your hands and we'll... Um, get you to be unmuted so that you can ask Luzon your question. But Luzon, maybe just firstly from, from my side, um, thank you for, for sharing a bit of your, like the, the professional journey so far and, and sharing about the, the challenges that there is with being blind and being so dependent on your, your guides. What I wanted to, my first question is, you're not only a runner. Um, you're also a resident aide um, there at the University of the Free State, where I'm also an alumni at. But... Yay! <laughs> so me and my wife, we're both alumni there. And... Exciting! <laughs> but for, for you and many of the, 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 the runners um, of Run For Us Run, they also don't just run. Yeah. Um, how do you manage the the requirements, the strain of everything? Yo, Rian, thank you. I'm I'm yeah. I started studying here, everybody, and then I started full time employment here five years ago. So strange how things just pan out. Um, so I think Rian, sometimes I don't manage. That's maybe why I'm a little bit sick now. But fortunately, um, yeah, I'm a I'm a residence head at the university. So that basically means I'm in charge of a female residence on campus. I have 179 students in my residence. Um, and fortunately for me, the type of work that I do here is quite flexible. So you can sort of juggle your schedule around students and around what you need to do. But we also have to juggle our schedules around um, the guides because I, like I said, I have two guides and obviously they also have jobs because um, I think from an early time, I realized that I would not be able to only run. Um, I need to be able, to, I need to plan for the future and I need to be financially stable as well. I didn't want to put myself in a position where I wasn't financially no. secure and okay. So I think, um, firstly, I think it's, it's, you know, sort of for me, what's helped me a lot is respecting other people's time. I think it's very difficult 
um, in a certain sense, because in essence, guides, the guides that I run with, they do it for free. So they're doing it out of being like, it's a favor that they do for me. Um, so we really have to, all three of us as a team, have to respect each other's time and each other's family time and work time. So it does sometimes get quite challenging, but we do find the time. I think if you really find, if you really want to do something, you'll find the time and you'll make the time to do it. Um, that being said, I obviously do realize that there's also, you know, there are people who like, I mean, also sometimes we have to get up at, at four to go train at five, you know, so sometimes we do crazy things and people who don't run think we are absolutely insane. Um, but yeah, I think for me, for me, it's, I think having how I managed running through, you know, by being like having a career and stuff as well is to absolutely just prioritize it. It's a, it's a, it's a no, it's a non-negotiable for me. I have to train. So for me, it's, it's literally one of those goals that I set for myself every day is my training goals. So I think for me, having that on a tick list almost helps to be able to, to do it um, consistently. Yeah. No, I understand. And um, I've got the question here as well from, from one of our, our runners. Can you maybe expand a bit about your why? Why do you run and what keeps you going? Yeah, so I think I'm very fortunate to, to have started running as a kind of a coping mechanism when I was a student, you know, to, to be fit and to be healthy. And for me, that is like key I never want to lose sight of that so emotional and physical well-being I would say is my why and competition comes after that because your identity is not in in your competition your identity is not in a specific race your identity is in who you are as a person and for me if I was only running to compete it would take the joy and the willingness to do it every day yeah. out of running and I think for me, that's that's my most important why is my own well-being and how I feel when I run. I mean, all of us know, yeah, you have terrible days where you really don't feel like going out to run. But somebody once said, even though you have those days, you always feel better when you come when you come home. And it might not be that you feel absolutely fantastic or the session might have gone horribly, but you feel better that you put on your shoes and you actually went out and you did it. Yeah. Um, and it's those days that pull you through in the end, those difficult days. So yeah, for me, I would say my why is my like physical and emotional well-being. And also it gives me a platform like this to talk to people and to give people like, just to, to send out the message that irrespective of what you want to achieve, if you believe in yourself and if you believe that you are able to achieve what you want to, you can you can do anything. Amen. Yeah, because it's it's not just about um, receiving praise or medals or things like that. It is really the what the running gives what physical activity gives exactly. oneself is um just all all round um benefit not only for you but also for those that are in your immediate vicinity and um but it's 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 great to hear your 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 why and another question that's that's come in is just what's the greatest thing that you've learned in life from your perspective, like your walk of life, what's oh, the, the, <laughs> what's the greatest lesson that you've you've learned so far? Um, I think for me, one of the <coughs> sorry, one of the greatest things that I've learned, and I think it's got a lot to do with with many things, but the way I was brought up, especially, is um. I think not to necessarily look for challenges in life, but to view challenges as not, if you had to ask me what was a challenge in my, in my life, I would be, it would be very difficult for me to say X, Y, and Z, because I think I forget about the challenges because I don't want to view them as challenges. I view them as obstacles or problems that, you know, if you have an issue, you need to overcome it. And I think, mm -hmm. 
for me, that's an important thing, especially living with a disability as well. You get a lot of extra issues. Like I can't necessarily drive myself somewhere and then it's an issue or I can't, you know, I can't just get into my car whenever I want to and go to the shops. And maybe sometimes it's difficult because I might need something quite urgently and then it's an issue. But I think not focusing on the issue per se, but focusing on how to solve a problem has sort of made me able to cut the challenges. Like I can't necessarily list if you had to ask me what like challenges are, I would have to think a bit um, because I don't view them as challenges. And I think to be, I think the biggest lesson I've learned then I guess would be to be solution driven and not problem driven. Mm. Yeah, because it is how you, how you view, view things um, because all of us face obstacles and we all face difficult times but it's how we how we frame that and how we like exactly. go around like the processes to to overcome no for sure and through you you mentioned um during your your talk the fact that at the rio olympics um that you were disqualified and how that impacted you but that's not necessarily like one of your that is one of the the running failures but how have you seen failure shaping your life for for the good when how do you how do you like build that lego pieces um, mm -hmm. to make sure that, that that the the failures don't define you i think failure it's an interesting term because um I actually was thinking about it today because I, I sort of today I'll actually I can share with you like a mini story but today at some point I think I was washing the dishes and I felt like you this week has been such a failure because I was sick for the beginning of the week and actually now I'm feeling a bit better and now my track guide is ill and he's the only guide at the moment in Bloemfontein this weekend Klaus my, my road guide is away for the long weekend and I was thinking to myself Yo, I think this week is such a failure because I'm not, I'm struggling to train. There's nobody to train with. So I have to treadmill and it just doesn't feel the same when you do things on a treadmill than on the road or on the track. And then I realized like at some point I just thought, but training this week is not my full identity. So I think for me, when, if you failed in one part of your life, that doesn't mean your life is a failure or you failed to, I failed I failed in running maybe in Rio because we were disqualified, we failed, but that doesn't mean that my running career has now failed. Or mm. even if let's say I don't run, let's say I don't compete anymore to, from tomorrow onwards, it wouldn't be, that's not what it's about for me. So I mm. think for me, when you, when, if you're a whole person and you don't necessarily focus on you can't, your whole life cannot be a failure because you are different things. I'm a sister, I'm a fiance, mm -hmm. I'm a resident head, I'm a runner, I'm many things. So failing in one aspect doesn't mean that your whole life is a failure. Yes. Yes. No, love, love that. Can just continue to say amen to like, <laughs> to, to that. And um, it's also, like you say, you failed but that doesn't make you a failure and many times uh -huh. that is the the trap that we we fall into we take something that we did mm. um, and make it uh, us thing it is me that's the, the the issue and rather than learn from it and mm. try and not repeat <laughs> no for sure definitely um question that has also come in is a is a nice one when are you getting married <laughs> oh okay i'm getting one. married in october the 7th of october very exciting so yeah we're in the process of arranging everything so yeah we're looking forward to it a lot nice this is going to be there in the platteland it is um, it's going to be just outside bloom at a venue called the willows and um, yeah, it's nice, and we I, I we planned it well, so it's planned for after my season. So I can in August and September I can only focus on wedding stuff. And that's the question that relates to that. Does your um, fiance 
firstly also run with you is he also a suitable guide and secondly as he told you no running during um like in the few weeks after after the after the wedding no fortunately, fortunately he hasn't however my one guide is convinced he's going on the honeymoon because he says i can't <laughs> not train so you you will obviously know a bit more about klaus but he's a very funny guy so he's invited himself on our honeymoon. I haven't <laughs> let him down hard yet by saying no, but obviously he knows he's not really coming. But he says that he will only be there for the training and then we can enjoy the rest of the holiday. He just wants to go on the holiday. Um, but no, he hasn't. He hasn't said that, fortunately. Um, but yeah, he is a runner, but more of a recreational runner. So I can do some sessions with him. So I can do my recovery runs with him. And yeah, he used to be fitter than he is now. Um, he's not very fit at the moment. So I can actually only do recoveries with him at the moment. But when he when he's fit, I can do like tempo runs with him as well. Cool. Um, we've got a bit of a running question for you. So, like I like I mentioned, many of many of our runners are taking on um, their first yeah. big runs, and especially like a half marathon for some for for some is the furthest that they've ever done, and they're only now in week four of of training. And the 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 question that has come in is. How do you overcome the running wall? And just thinking of 21 kilometers now. The running wall. Like the wall that you hit. Yeah. Um, how do you overcome? <laughs> how do you overcome that? Okay, so I've had like situations. I'll be honest, I'm gonna be brutally honest because it doesn't help to sugarcoat things. <laughs> um, I've had, had situations where I didn't overcome the wall, but um the biggest difference for me in the longer distances so from i would say from a 21 upwards is the wall you get is it's a different wall than you experience with shorter distances i don't know if you also would agree with me but so when you run shorter distances other things in your body happens when you run and you're running further than a 21 or maybe for some people in a 21 it can also happen but suddenly you feel very tired then you know okay you hit a wall and you just have to run through the wall so sometimes for me in my first marathon running through the wall meant i had to run the whole 42 and then i stopped so the wall went away but i've i in my tokyo race for example i experienced a bit of a wall between the 26 and the 30k mark and then it was gone so you you just the only like there's two things so you have to hydrate properly which will help you not it might make the wall a little bit shorter or it might help you not to hit the wall as bad so make sure that even if you're not thirsty start drinking a few sips from the first or the second water point whatever you're going to do um especially if it's a distance that you're not familiar with because bad long races for me has also come from not hydrating properly. And once I don't stick to my hydration plan, everything falls apart. So mm -hmm. stick to a plan, work out a nice hydration plan for yourself beforehand. And when you're close to, so in a half marathon, I would say between, between the 12 and the 16 K mark, take a gel, then it would give you a nice boost for the last three to five Ks. Then you would have a good, um, you know, kind of, you'd be able to to do your last 5k with a lot of energy and in a in a full marathon i would definitely i would start with water a full marathon or further i would start with water and i would you know then like let's say from the 15k mark i would alternate between water and something else like a, a biogen or energade or whatever it depends are you going to carry something with you or are you going to drink something that there is going to be that's going to be available on the race so that that is solely dependent on you but from then on i would alternate and i would what we normally do so our recipe is between the 27k and the 30k you take a gel and um then from there on you that gel gives you a nice boost for the last eight or so k's it's obviously going to depend on how long you run. So if you're going to run for five hours, 
you need to make sure that you hydrate and then, it, then you need to take more than one gel. So mm. I, I would get a nutrition expert involved, maybe if you're going to run um, far, like very far and quite long. Um, but sometimes you just, you recover from the wall and sometimes you don't. And that is also, um, that's a risk that you take as a runner. Um, it can happen and it can't happen. Anything can happen on a marathon. Um, those mm. of you who have run marathons, you would know um, it's very difficult to predict and it's very difficult to, to um, duplicate circumstances because it's never going to be the same. Um, yeah, and that's that's my opinion on the wall. Um, I've mm -hmm. had bad experiences and I've had better experiences. And I think for all runners, that's going to be the same. But don't be scared. Once you hit the wall, just continue putting one foot in front of the other and just work through it. You'll get through it eventually. Yes. And I can also just tell the runners that we are privileged to, in two weeks' time, we're going to have Brunel Bosch that is a sports nutritionist. So That's she is going to um, provide us also with some plans and some assistance with regards to that um, from a nutrition standpoint. And then from a, just the mental aspect of, of things, I would definitely, like from what Luzon has mentioned, put the one foot in front of the other. It doesn't, it's not about how fast you complete this as like, remember that this is the first time that you're going to complete a half marathon. Completing it is the victory. The yes, yes. So, um, but Luzon, maybe if you can also provide a bit of input relating to, you're working towards the goal. The goal is, let's say, three months away or six months mm -hmm. away, but maybe today I don't feel like it or I'm this discouraged I don't want to mm -hmm. go out how do you how do you get yourself out the door and going because you know you know what the goal is but you're like yeah. ah, it's okay if I miss today so for me um I have I also have those days um, I think we all do. Mm. Um, and for me, like I said, training is a tick box. So if I don't go, I can't tick the box. And that, like for my personality, that works quite well. <laughs> um, I like ticking boxes. So, so I, um, I think on those days, what's often, what's important is for you to just show up and to do your session, whatever your session may be. And I've had sessions this year where I literally, we stop looking at the watch because it, there's just, it doesn't make sense to look at the watch anymore because you're so far off your target. You just complete the reps mm. um, because sometimes that's all that's needed. And those tough days make you run well when you actually at your final goal and tell yourself that and say to yourself that if I show up today, it'll make, achieving and attaining my goal a little bit easier um but yeah i i literally a big like something that i would say and and maybe um this might be a challenge for some but on those days and if you're really feeling awful don't look at your watch anymore because it doesn't matter anymore um and if you don't hit the target that day it's maybe it just maybe it's better for you not to know it. I know that sounds strange, but I mean, I mean, even for me, I like I targets are intense for me on the track, and I I need to hit my targets in order to know what I'm going to run in my race. And sometimes I just can't. Um, and then you you just there's some point where you need to stop looking at the watch and just complete your session. Mm. And but you need to show up. Yes, it's that, it's that consistency. Um, yeah. And for for our runners, we've got another two and a bit months left. And I know you're looking at that distance now and you're thinking, how the heck am I going to run that? <laughs> Remember, we're in the building phase still. And as you build that those long runs, 
your mm. confidence is going to start um, increasing and your overall fitness is going to um, also increase. And as you consistently pitch up, like Luzon says, then I promise you race day is going to be an incredible experience. Mm. Definitely. And on that, I would just say, I this year I also had a bit of a challenging build up to um, my national championships. And when I went to Cape Town in March, I literally thought, okay, I am going to be able to run. If I run below a five minutes, I would be quite shocked on the 1,500 meters. And then I ran a four minutes and 50 seconds, which is 10 seconds faster than I thought I was going to be able to run. So sometimes you just, you're going to surprise yourself in the end. It might not feel like it now. And your body might be going through the most at the moment in terms of mm. soreness and in terms of fatigue. But when race day comes, you're going to surprise yourself if you properly type it and you properly did everything that you needed to do. So just have faith in your program, have faith in your training and have faith in your end goal. And sometimes you, you're really going to surprise yourself. Yes. Um, a bit of a fun question. We know that you love baking as well, Luzon. Like oh, what's, okay. your, what's your um, go-to? What's the, the recipe that the fiancé loves the most? Yeah, that's a problem because he doesn't like sweet stuff. And <laughs> I enjoy sweet things, so I don't bake at the moment because I need to be my own race weight. So I... I'm finding it challenging because I eat everything I bake and he doesn't he like he eats like a quarter and I eat the rest. So that's a problem. Um, but I enjoy baking biscuits. Um, those crunchy like oats kind of biscuits are very nice for me. I enjoy baking them. And it's also a, I tell myself it's a bit more nutritious, which is a lie. Um, but yeah, so I enjoy that. And in Afrikaans, we have rusks, um, biscuits. So I enjoy mm. I enjoy baking rusks um yeah i enjoy baking many things i like experimenting so i like i like experimenting with new recipes today we made waffles so that was fun um yeah so i i enjoy i enjoy being in the kitchen i just don't enjoy washing dishes <laughs> um who does oh well like I, I, I actually do because my wife is she is again br brilliant and all i can contribute is is that so I normally when I wash the dishes I'll put a sermon on or put like a, mm. my a, a audio audio something. books on or something yeah. and just yeah keep the keep the mind going um hey I have a, another question for you so when you you start like you, I I know um maybe for some of the other um the runners you were in a blind school um in in the Worcester. western cape in, yeah. in Worcester and mm -hmm. then you moved to like to Bloemfontein to start studying there and you were yeah. in the residence there at Rus Marine mm -hmm. mm -hmm. how do you how did that transition from like everyone everything is catered towards yeah. you to now like I was at that university no, you're nothing just is number. nothing is catered towards well, anyone <laughs> people with, with disabilities and so how was that 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 transition for you um you know Rian it was it was very challenging and I think that also contributed to me starting to run quite a lot when I was a student um so to give everybody an idea so um I went to pioneer school in, in a small town in the Western Cape when I was six years old. And I went to boarding school there until matric. And then I had to decide, am I going to study in Cape Town or am I going to study in Bloemfontein? And I came back to Bloom and I started studying here. Um, and my high school, my total high school had 80 students in. So it is very small. Like, like Rian says, like literally people know you by name. They kite, everything is catered for you. And then I came to my residence at the University of the Free State campus, and it was 240 students. So it was literally triple my high school. 
And I remember I told my mom the first day, I'm never going to find my room. Like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> and yeah, I think that for me was a, a very big challenge. And also being exposed to many more things. Um, it was mentally tough for me realizing mm. that I can't play hockey for my residents. I can't play netball for my residents. I can't. I can't fully social during an inter if somebody doesn't talk to me as well. You know, I can't necessarily, I can dance, but it's like, I feel uncomfortable. And there was a, a lot of things, but I just felt sure. I, I all of a sudden was exposed to a lot of things that I couldn't do, which, which mm. wasn't the case in school. And it took some getting used to, I'm used to it now, I think, but um coming from that sheltered world into a world where, you know, things just aren't catered for you and you all of a sudden exposed to how little you can contribute. And you really feel like uncomfortable and as if you're taking up space. And I think in, in that sense, running saved me also because I, um, you know, that, that was something that where I would, con where I could contribute again. And that was some way where I could get involved again. So I, I think finding that thing that you, you also feel that you can do to make a difference in other people's yes. lives is very important. Yes. No, that's that's amazing. And I and I know that you didn't just stop there. You were also then involved um, at the, the SRC and also helping to make the university more accessible. I try. Um, at the moment, I'm quite excited because I started at um, Kofsi Sport, so the sports department at the beginning of the year. So we're going to try to create a bit of a more um, disabled sports friendly environment for our students with disabilities because we have quite a few. Yes. Um, and we supported a few of them. The university supported a few of them going to national championships and they're going to support some with, with equipment now. And we're going to assist our blind cricket team with training place and like you know getting them onto a field so I'm very excited because that also you know gives me the opportunity to to give other people the opportunity to do sport so yeah I'm I try to if I if if it's at all possible for me I try to make a difference um where I can yes no I've, I love that Luzon because what you what you're saying is I'm taking my five loaves and my two fish and what I have and I'm I'm just doing what I can and trusting God with the rest and mm, if we're true. all we're all we're all here for for a reason and it's it's never only for our own benefit and we're blessed to be a blessing whether you you think that or or not and we can all make an impact on other people's lives and even if it's one person you're changing the world for that that one Thank so exactly. that's yeah that's incredible and i just wanted to if there's any other questions from our our running community in the q and a's okay great um i just wanted to ask luzon if there is um We'll we'll share maybe your um, we'll share your Instagram and your Facebook um, details with um, with people so that they can follow your journey to the the next Olympics and the next World Champs. Um, is there anything um, else um, that we can also follow? Like you you mentioned the foundation. Um, is is there um, any details relating to that? I actually have, um, thanks for that, Rian. I have an um, a email address that oh, people know, can know. contact me on if they want to. It's info at luzon.co.za. Um, and my, I, yeah, we, I just, I started with a web page now. My fiance yes. has been bugging me about a web page. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, so much admin. But anyway, um, 
yeah so so if people want to pop me a question on instagram or facebook they're really more than welcome to even if you have questions about the foundation i think for the moment that's going to be the easiest for people to get involved yes. with um i also we have a match kit page i have a, a page on match kit which which i can send you the link to as well um if you wanted to share it afterwards um and then yeah if people want to they can pop me an email or they can just send me a message on facebook or instagram i'm quite active so um they'll definitely be able to find me there and whether it is anything from questions to the foundation or if they may be just feeling a little bit nervous in front of a race i would i would be more than willing to just you know just to chat and to just be there and if if advice is needed i can help um i love what you guys are doing i think it's amazing and i really think it's very inspirational that you guys are all challenging yourselves so much um so you're just well well done on that and it's such a privilege to be involved here and you know to be able to speak to everybody um so yeah you're more than welcome to contact if, if, contact me thanks Luzon. uh i think i'm gonna close the the call with with that thank you Luzon. thank you for being so generous with thanks, your Maria. time and thank you that we've been able to hear a bit of your story and be encouraged by how you tackle life um, head on. We are really um, so privileged to have had you and we will continue to follow your journey. Oh, thanks, Rian. And I'm looking forward to what you guys are also going to do. I'm going to check you guys out um, <laughs> in July. Awesome. <laughs> Super keen. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Luzon. Well, thanks, everybody. everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.